There we go. Good evening, everybody. How are you? Good evening. Hello, hello. Joined by uh, joined by not Seb. Welcome, welcome to the podcast. We're at episode eleven. Been doing this for eleven weeks. Not bad. Joined by Johan. Joined by Muna. We don't have Devin with us. He's uh, he's apparently still at work. So uh, hopefully yeah, he's apparently he's working. Hopefully he's, uh, he's he's got his headphones in, and uh, <laughs> he's uh, he's giving us a listen. We have a lot to uh, to get through today. Um, let's start with uh, let's start with T and B. What uh, what can we say about last week? Obviously, it was much uh, better compared to the previous week. Lobby <laughs> one. Uh, yes, and uh, we we actually finished that lobby that we started. So uh, yeah, no, that was, and we didn't have to start it a couple of times. So wasn't wasn't too bad, and the safety car didn't pull any uh, any crazy crazy stuff. Yeah. Uh, who was the uh, your winner? Do you want to remind me? Matt Hamilton. Uh, uh-huh. Matt Hamilton. Because at the end, right at the end, he took it pretty much. But of course, Sebi was the guy being second. So it's kind of like your usual suspects in the top three. Yeah, I, I threw that race away. So. <coughs> yeah. Also, yeah, because if it came down, you know, <coughs> the penalty count, unfortunately, that's what counted against Sebi. So, not Sepp was the man to, to pretty much on course for the win. It's just unfortunately a couple of penalties came into play. But in the end, Matt, uh, not Sebastian, and not Kimi. Look, I'm not going to take anything away from Matt. He started last, second last. Uh, he drove a hell of a race. He drove one hell of a race. So, uh, where does this leave us in the championship? <laughs> Obviously. Your winner last last time around that was Matt, and uh, he's leading the championship. He's got now one hundred and one point five points. That point five is going to continue to annoy me for the rest of the season. And then, uh, Are you giving me the carry to round it off? Then give me give me the other point five. He's in second. It's quite a quite a drop off though. Matt's already got uh, eighteen points. Quite a lead. And then uh, RZDV still holding on to third in the championship. And uh, that second place helping not Sebastian up into fourth. Four points behind RZDV. But uh, you're already, already 40 points adrift. So we uh, need, some, uh, need yeah. some performances and some mistakes from the Renault. Yeah, I won't, I won't bring previous races into it, but being taken out by... Our old Matt Hamilton didn't really help my championship, but <laughs> your, your tassel in Bahrain. <clears throat> yeah. If anyone who doesn't know who Matt Hamilton is, that yeah, that's your championship leader. Yeah. yeah. Also known as Boris. <laughs> Boris Johnson. Then uh, looking over at the uh, at the constructors. Arena well. Well. Look at that. Said it at Arena. the beginning of the season as a joke. <laughs> Renault would win the constructors, and uh, well, they're leading. <laughs> Look at them now. Leading by quite a margin, I may add. That's 137 points, 0.5. And then uh, Red Bull in second with 88.5. And uh, Alpha holding on to third with 88. Uh, not, not too bad. We're ahead of Merck. But that Renault second, but the Renault second driver also contributing. Decent amount of points to make sure that they have a decent uh, lead on the rest. But also good results this Friday for Red Bull. Of course, not Maverick pitching up as a reserve. Some good points scored for Red Bull, moving them up to second. From the uh, from the point of view of a commentator, what did you think of the race in terms of you know, me and Muna? We were in a cockpit, so we only saw what we saw from there. What uh, what did you make of the race? Was the passing? Was there was it a good First race? First of all. Yeah? First of all, like I said, 
It was actually awesome seeing we managed to finish our lobby. We didn't even need to restart the lobby. We didn't let any shenanigans compared to the week before. Oh, wow. Well, and things then, we're grateful for. And then, of course, what you just asked now, passing. There's been some interesting battles throughout the grid again. It's not just basically one or two again. And it's quite interesting, you know, and it makes it also difficult to accommodate sometimes because you don't know where to flip to which battle to, to you know, spectate on. But a couple of battles throughout, and of course, as you said earlier, Matt coming all the way from the back. So he had a couple of battles on his way to the front and a good start as well. Nice to see Nismax in the, in the mix as well. Good start from him. Even uh, the likes of uh, Legend who had a brilliant start. So a couple of guys showing good pace in qualifying and were good at the start of a race. And it's not the usual suspect. So that's always nice to see other guys also coming through and challenging and putting guys under pressure. It was a it was a good race. It was a difficult race, but uh, yeah, it was a I I managed to get another hundred percent finish, so uh, it's okay. Didn't expect and too many points from that up. round anyway. It's not uh, not the best. But where are we off to next? Yeah. Can you remind us? Say again. Where are we off to next? Next one will be Russia. Sochi. Going My to Sochi. absolute favorite. My absolute favorite. I enjoy that track for the most part. There's a, there's a few tricky sections that still need sorting out, but uh, I think uh, I think the result will be a lot better than last week. I made a comment in the post race interview as well on Friday. Uh, last season, literally just a season ago, we we also happened to do Sochi. And the not sober racing boys actually put up a hell of a show. Uh, of course, Sebi and Kimi, Kimi both ended up going to the back of the grid at one stage due to some wing damages and stuff. But at the end of the day, they both fought their way back for some good battles and not Kimi winning that one in the end. So I'm expecting some of the same for this coming Friday. I hope so. Pole, pole position last year in Sochi. That was uh, that was by Charles Leclerc. That was a one thirty six, sorry, a one thirty one six. So uh, <laughs> that's massive. That's that's anything to go by one thirty one six. Ah no, we'll have, no. To, uh, we'll have to wait and see. <laughs> for, have to wait. Uh, this year's I'm calling it. I'm calling it low one thirties. Will be Paul. Don't. <laughs> that's probably because that's what he's doing. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> I won't. I won't let you uh, get dragged any more into his tales of sandbagging, because we all know it's lies. But he's not the master of sandbagging. We know there's a few other guys here, and a certain yes. Renault driver showed how much he can sandbag in the last week. He's got some uh, some serious. Uh, even uh, Dirk, when I used to commentate, watching him in uh, watching him in Q2. And it, well, Q1 and Q2, it was usually quite useless. He'd, uh, he'd do just enough that was required, and then uh, in Q3, you'd oh. see his actual pace. Maybe, and, and Matt, only on his second run in Q3. Yeah, and Matt so, also leads it to very, very late. All holding on right until the end, sandbagging. And uh, nobody wanting to... Let anyone know what their pace is <laughs> until just before the race. <laughs> Let's have a look now. Uh, obviously, we've got uh, a lot to talk about. Obviously, F1 happened uh, happened last week, and it was a uh, it was a good one. Hey, Max Verstappen. Ma uh, say Max. Red Bull Racing, Max Verstappen. They. Uh, they did it. They, they outsmarted the masters. But like his comment at the end, why he did not hold back like a grandma behind uh, the Mercedes when he was told to basically manage a gap. He kept on pushing and it worked because he jumped 
basically the Mercs had that first pit stop and then it was so the Bottas basically out of the way so it was always going to be him and Hamilton and then later you heard that Hamilton team radio that the, the true threat to them is Max and that's exactly what happened yeah it was, a, it was an interesting race I actually I didn't see where the strategy came from I just I was watching and uh, the next thing when I started looking at the times and the gaps and who still needed to pit and it was like, wait a second. What did Watch happen? <laughs> <laughs> and I and think that's about the same time as Merck woke up. So And he started on the hard way. They started on the mediums and he had a good start. He even came past Hulkenberg on the softer tyre at the start and he actually ran a good couple of laps later before he finally put it and that's where he made up that time. It was a was a brilliant strategy. I've actually I've actually been thinking that with this. Uh, obviously, the first race in Britain was won by Merck. The second race was won by Red Bull. Very very different races. But do you think this makes an argument for back to back races or maybe dual race weekends? If it's going to go like this, I would say yes. It's a, it's a no practice. practice. Yeah. yeah. Just keep out practice, because why do you want to practice again? You've been there already a week, all weekend. You give, you give the Oaks free practice three on a Saturday, they do qualify on a Saturday, and they race Sunday. Simple. Okay. One practice session, one qualifying session, and the race. Yeah. Well, that's what we're going to see later on in the season. Um, actually, at San Marino. Uh, I need to stop calling it that. At Imola. Imola. At, uh, at Imola. It's going to be a shortened weekend. And that actually came, that, that wasn't actually, that was just F1 being clever. They were like, we're, we're going to, yeah, we're, we're giving it a trial run. This actually had nothing to do with a trial run. This had to do with the fact that they couldn't get from the south of Portugal to the north of Italy in the given amount of time. So uh, that's why they went for the shortened weekend and decided, okay, well, we'll, we'll test this hybrid. I, I actually think it could work. I think it could <laughs> Teams just having less time really to to mess around and and uh, you've just got that that one ninety minute session and everybody's really got to go out on track and 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 make the most of it if they're going to get some data before they get to qualifying. Sixty, so, um, minutes. 60 minutes. Yeah, so you'll have one very busy practice session. Okay, and uh, could be could be interesting. And uh, I think this calendar could. This whole 2020 thing could shake things up going forward where where mm -hmm. things that were implemented this year may remain. Like even, even certain tracks we picked up this year, I wouldn't be surprised if they found a more permanent uh, spot on the calendar. Uh, Portimong is getting a huge resurface. So uh, they're doing an entire resurface of the whole track. So, uh, and uh, MotoGP is also going to be doing their finale there so um so it's going to be it's going to be interesting and uh now with that track resurfaced i'm sure they're going to want to remain on the f1 calendar beyond 2020 so um mm -hmm. and they are a grade one circuit so i think we could see lasting changes to the to the f1 calendar because of this but, uh just to have a look what happened uh in that uh, in that race, there's your full result. I think we just get this out of the way. There we go. Obviously, Verstappen winning the race by 11.3 seconds from the two Mercs, Hamilton and Bottas. Hamilton getting past his teammate there. Bottas obviously starting on pole, getting into turn one in first. And uh, really at the end, they didn't have, didn't have much of a fight. And, and I don't really know why. They were on exactly the same strategy. Um, in fact, he had the benefit of, of putting first. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was just much faster. Also, fresher rubber team. Because he stopped much later on his final stop. So, obviously, your top three. And then, obviously, in fourth, Leclerc. Pulling out another relatively good performance. When you think of the state of that Ferrari. The state of his teammate. Mm -hmm. Albon. <laughs> Be happy with that. Uh, brought the car home in fifth. Not bad. Then, well, if you uh, look at it, Charles, 
did a one stopper. Yeah, that's right. He did a one stopper on, and and we all said a one stopper was. Uh, is that the question? I have a question given uh, to how the tyres expire. And obviously, uh, Stroll finishing up in sixth. Yeah, I have finishing up in seventh. That. I saw a comment on Twitter this, well, yesterday. I saw a comment on Twitter, and when I saw this comment, I thought to myself, but this is exactly what I was thinking at the time when I saw this because I watched the race. And a very, very late call from Racing Point bringing Hulk into the pits, which I couldn't understand. I mean, so close to the finish, why you want to pit him now? And what's the point? He's in good position and he looks good on that tyres. And someone actually made the comment that he got pitted, so just not to uh, outperform the more permanent driver being stroll, because last thing you want is your permanent driver to be outdone by your reserve driver. So it's almost like that pit stop was to switch drivers. Word and from uh, uh, word from word from racing <laughs> word from racing point was that. Uh, they had, picked up, they had picked up a vibration yeah. on the car and uh, told him to 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 rather come in and and uh, do the tire swap rather than risk a puncture risk a puncture at the end there. But um, also, you know, I don't know. Would a team do that and and possibly sacrifice no. more positions? Like, I mean, he could have landed up behind Ocon and Norris and. Mm. I don't know. Plus, uh, Racing Point also sent out a very... Um, they sent out a tweet regarding all these conspiracy theories and uh, said that Lawrence Stroll does not form part of our strategic team. <laughs> so, uh, okay, that's one way. So they closed those rumors pretty quickly. Let's uh, let's have a look what, what hap what's happening in the championship obviously Hamilton leads the championship uh, now 107 points Max is, second. Max is in second on 77 so that's uh that's really a 40 point deficit Bottas second Merck really I don't think he's doing what he should with that car he's not getting the most out nope, of it no. he's in third nope, no. can't believe Leclerc is fourth in the championship um, oh wow. wow considering where they've been qualifying, how many times they've missed Q3. Um, Norris still hanging on to fifth, just ahead of his friend Albon in the uh, in the got a good result in the last race, so that will that will help those those points a bit. And then obviously the the Racing Point boys they've they've gone down the championship. Um, no, they the drivers didn't lose points. Correction it was yeah, only the. Uh, was only the constructor, yeah. but Stroll on 28, and then Perez obviously on 22. But Perez has had two less races. So uh, let's have a look what's happening in the constructors. If I can just find it. There's way too much stuff on my screen. Well, did you see a report from Ferrari? Um, Vettel was speaking to them about getting a new chassis for the next race. Yeah. I also heard something about that. If you want the chassis to be swapped, right out, he's free to do so. Yeah. Couldn't get a uh, image of the constructors, so just to read them out, the Merck's obviously leading that championship on 180 points. Red Bull in second with 113, and then, uh, well, Ferrari on 55 points in third place, hmm. and they're just two points ahead of McLaren. And then racing point on 41 after that. Uh, how many points was it? 15? 15 constructors points? So they would yeah, have been yeah. on 56. They would have been third in the championship. So uh, it's still a bit of controversy going around about that because they got uh, they got a hefty fine, but they can still use the car. But that's so, the thing. How do you find for someone, but they can still use it? Does it easy? How, if, how if, it, if it's illegal and, and it's you're easy. getting fined for it, then... Why is it on the racetrack? Exactly. And well, it should if it's on the racetrack, then it shouldn't have been fined. Uh, you should have gone one way or the other. If you say it's okay to race with him, why the fine? And obviously, uh, next week we head to Catalonia. Not the uh, 
not the usual time of year to be in mm. Catalonia. So it's mm. going to be very Quite interesting. Late. August is, um, I can tell you from, from personal experience that that side of Europe, August is, uh, it's the hottest. It's as hot as it gets. Um, basically, in uh, I don't know how it is in Spain and, and that, but, but I know in Portugal, um, in August, um, a lot of people actually take leave. That that's when people take leave. Like uh, it's almost the equivalent of our December, where like a lot of people are off for for a majority of that month. Um, in August, everybody just sort of takes vacation, and then that December holiday is a much shorter stop, basically like a one week stop for Christmas, and then you get going again. So um, in August, everybody's off, and it's going to be quite weird to have this uh, F one vibe in Spain. And uh, all these people not able to watch the race. Mm. It's quite a quite a cr crowd favorite there in Catalonia and uh, this time around. Did you actually see what was happening at the MotoGP? They were having serious trouble keeping the fans out. The mm -hmm. fans were coming in through the woods. Mm. And uh, <laughs> yeah, apparently like they, they had extra stewards out the whole weekend just chasing fans. And... Um, so yeah, that's that's quite interesting because the guys are like, no, we're gonna sneak into this racetrack. It actually sounds like something T and B would do. It is. Yeah, we're, gonna, we're gonna sneak uh -huh. into Kyle Army. <laughs> actually, we just need to probably stand on Muna's roof and watch. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I like. Be able to have a good view there as well. Obviously, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Just to uh, just to go through some. Some F1 news. I didn't like this one. I didn't like this one at all. It mm -hmm. made I actually it made me feel even worse for the Hulk. Oh boy. Did you guys read uh Ross Braun put out a uh puts out like a a blog sort of thing once a week. Nah. And uh basically the whole topic of this one was when Ross Braun went yeah. after Lewis Hamilton for Mercedes Benz, if Lewis Hamilton had said, no, I'm staying at McLaren, second option was Nico Hulkenberg. Yeah. 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 So that man's career could have been different. very, very, very different. Sure. And um, just to stay on the uh, topic of the Hulk, might not have seen the end of the Hulk. The Hulk has entered into talks with Alfa Romeo. Mm. So I don't know what is the status of Kimi Raikkonen's contract. I don't I know. I keep hearing. I keep hearing retirement coming up. I, I Kimi yeah, didn't seem. From what I saw in the last race, he didn't seem. You know, Kimi's always Kimi, but. But it's like Vettel, there's nothing at the moment. Kimi always seems disinterested, but you can sort of tell when he's just, he's not even being himself. He's just, he's not, yeah. he wasn't enjoying his racing. He wasn't enjoying the car. Um, and yeah, maybe, maybe retirement is something that's, uh, that's coming sooner than we think for, uh, mm -hmm. for the man who actually, he, uh, he got a record over the weekend. I just want to get the exact number. Most, the most completed laps. Yeah, I'm going to get the number up on screen if I can 16, just find it. 16 or 123 or 1,600 or 16,000 or something like that. Can you see the body tell us I'm not mistaken? The most the head of... Uh, he beat there we Michael go. Schumacher's record. Surpassing Michael Schumacher's F1 record for most laps raced. Kimi Raikkonen, 16,845 laps. Yeah, yeah. 16,845 laps. So, uh, <laughs> wow. That's a lot of time in an what? F1 car. And, that, and that's racing laps. So that's not qualifying or testing or practice or that that's actual race time in a cockpit. That doesn't include anything else. So it um, also speaks back to the liability and capability of driver. Because uh, someone like a Barrichello at the most races, but he's even near that. 
going from one Nico to another Nico. Go to the Nico who occasionally likes to stir the pot. <laughs> Did he do again? Nico Rosberg has uh, basically come out and said that Sebastian Vettel is one of the greatest drivers of all time. And there is no way he is half a second slower than Leclerc. And there is something oh. fundamentally wrong with his Ferrari. Uh -huh. So, uh, interesting. Talk about staring that pot. Oh, he loves it. And he'll never stop. Do you guys see what happened on the F1 podium with Lewis? I think he's getting a bit used to winning. When he took the Max's trophy. Yeah, Max was like that. That's the P1 trophy, mate. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna need that. You're gonna, you're gonna have to bring it back. Oh well, that that's when you really get. Uh, Max also got a uh, got a record uh, this weekend. He at the age of 22, he's now the youngest driver to achieve 1,000 championship points. Oh wow, that many already. At the age of 22, he has 1,000 wow. championship points. So uh, that's, even, that's even faster than Lewis. <laughs> it's pretty decent. Yeah. But shows you uh, how he actually gets out of that Red Bull as well. But again, Red Bull, Ferrari, is it is Albon that bad? Or is it just the focus is on the one driver more than the other? But again, why would you not want to focus on both cars, get more, ma get maximum possible points out of a weekend? Then uh, this weekend, Formula Two driver Roy uh, Roy Nazani, I think that I think that's his name, Nazani, Roy Nazani, yeah. will be making his test debut. That's on Friday, so he'll be uh, getting behind the wheel of, I think it's Nicholas Latifi's Williams, and. Uh, He'll be having his first go around in a, in an F1 car. I, th I believe he's an is Israeli driver. So, okay. uh, yeah, I've uh, I've seen him a bit in, uh, in Formula Two, but uh, yeah, good luck to him. But uh, Williams have got a lot of test drivers, not 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 a lot of seats. I mean, I think is Dan Tictum. I think Dan Tictum is a Williams driver. Uh, yeah. This. Uh, Roy Nazani, he's a he, and so is Jamie Chadwick. So um, yeah, they've and and all of those drivers have points, super super license points, so they can drive. Um, but isn't Tictum a, a little bit like Lewis? If things Dan don't go his way, he's very vocal. Dan Tictum's an interesting character because you know when when you get when you get to like where Lewis Hamilton is. Okay, I think to to a certain extent you're allowed to moan. You know, you're a six time world champion. If you think if you think things aren't right, you're gonna say like, I don't think yes, things are right. But um if you're an up and coming driver who basically needs all the help he can get because you know your goal is to get into F one and F one is a very difficult thing to get into. You've already been dropped by the Red Bull academy um because of various even I, I i even think it came down to radio messages things he he screamed at the team and they were like no this is this is not on mm -hmm. and um he went to super formula in japan and uh, didn't make any friends there either and uh somehow he's uh he's kept kept on getting lucky and now he's uh he's driving in f2 they didn't have a great race over the weekend and uh he actually, he, he actually had quite a, he actually had quite a, he actually had quite a rant at uh, at some of his engineers and and even the commentators stepped in but, and said no Dan that this is that's not on. Running someone off or something like that. Yeah, he really uh, really went a bit over the top, and uh, but that's what he's known for. So um, we've actually mm -hmm. I've actually tried to time this perfectly because I'm trying to keep the podcast to one hour. So I tried to do the TNB and the F1 in half an hour, and we've done that. So uh, the final half an hour, we can talk about. We have to talk about it. The Brad Bender victory. The, fin the final half an hour, we have to talk about the man himself, Brad Bender. Wow, 
what uh, what can you say? One is debut two, race. Two times in, number two times number thirty three. Two times Red Bull livery. One on four wheels. One on two wheels. So what a Sunday it was. It was actually three. Yeah, yeah, the other one, the other one wasn't a Red Bull, but uh, <laughs> Moto Moto Two was won by a uh, bike thirty three. Bike thirty three. Mm. So, uh, yeah, it was a good was day to a, play the Good, good number, <laughs> good number to have on the on the day. So, uh, Brad Binder also now becoming first the other. first rider since Mark Marquez to win, win in the Premier yeah. Class uh, in his rookie season. So, uh, and, and the first African, and he's the first South African ever to to win in the Premier MotoGP class. Obviously, he won his uh, Moto3 championship back in, I think it was in 2016. He won his, uh, and then moved up to Moto2. Took a while to get used to the bike. And then basically in 2019, he was runner-up in the uh, Moto2 championship. And that was enough for, for KDM to promote him into the factory team. It's actually quite lucky he got into the factory team. There was a number of things that, worked out that way um miguel Oliveira was going to get this ride and then he had a massive accident and uh yeah, yeah. he decided that he wanted to do his return at ktm tech 3 rather than you know try and get fit and jump onto a factory bike so uh they took the next rider that was on their list and that was brad binder so he got the seat miguel Oliveira will be joining him next season so he'll be getting there a year late uh, Paul Espargo, obviously, uh, he will be leaving KTM. He's going to be joining Repsol Honda alongside Mark Marquez. And, uh, yeah, obviously, we're going to Red Bull land next weekend and the weekend after that. MotoGP is going now to Austria for, for two weeks at the Red Bull ring. And Brad's won there twice. He's won there on Moto3. He's won there on Moto2. On Red Bull KTM's, yeah, and it's a strong, it's a strong track for the KTM teams. <coughs> what impressed me the most about the race, or, or or the race victory, was really the way he did it. You know, there was never a time where I looked at the timing sheets and said, "I think he's calming down," um, or "I think he's taking it easy," or he he rode in exactly the same way from the beginning of the race to the end of the race on that final lap he was still opening up the gap to second place and he just he dominated he was one with the bike it didn't look like he had any scares that we saw on camera actually he wasn't on camera a lot because he was uh was quite a ways met. ahead remember we were we were shouting at the commentators Show when he started, when he started the last lap he, all the guys on the football were basically telling him just to relax but he Spoken. was I've spoken to a few people today about this and like so many people have told me that on the last three laps they they got up and walked away <laughs> um they they weren't at their tv screen i sat here at my tv screen but uh i'll tell you it wasn't comfortable i wasn't uh no, no, no. i wasn't happy and and i think as soon as he got into a podium position i i, I wasn't uh i was very very nervous so um he did a great job he Caught Morbidelli, who already had a, a huge gap when when Brad achieved second. Morbidelli was quite a ways ahead, and um, really reeled him in like nothing. Made the pass look easy, and uh, disappeared into the distance. There wasn't much more to say. That was that gap kind of like what Marquez did in that race, would ultimately cost him well potentially season. That's when he fell and got hurt. But yeah, Marquez that race was also catching people at a, at a quite a nasty rate. And that's what Brad did this Sunday. Brad was just on fire, switched on, everything was just coming together and just falling into place. And how he kept it all together. No, oh, brilliant, brilliant drive. I mean, how many people, when, when the moment became too big, they would have messed it up. Oh, yeah. <coughs> Brad I was I was watching from, uh, you know, from Franco Morbidelli, who was another first-time podium finisher, and then Zarco on the first first time on the podium since I think 2018, I think, on a, on a Yamaha. 
when Tech 3 was still a Yamaha, the, the, that monster Yamaha, I think that's the last yeah. time he was on a podium. Yeah, yeah. No, he actually won a race. He did. He won France, if I remember correctly. He, he won was, France, or he was I second think, or something like that. I think he was never on the podium <clears throat> for KTM. So, uh, <clears throat> no, no. And then the rest of that field, Valentino Rossi, uh, sorry about that, Alex Rins, he came in in fourth. And then Rossi, another strong finish, fifth. Got third in the last race. So, uh, a bit of a. Look at where Fabio ended up, seventh. Yeah, for, for yeah, a guy finished, that finished, was, was, actually finished behind Miguel Oliveira and by like four seconds adrift of Miguel Oliveira. So, uh, yeah, just, I mean, for a guy that's that's praised to be contesting for the championship, you can't be finishing seventh. I don't know what happened there. I don't know if it was just he 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 doesn't fit with the circuit or he chose the wrong tires or. I don't know. He had the same tyres as his teammate, and his teammate was flying no, in the beginning of the race. his teammate had a soft rear. Oh, his teammate had a different... Uh... But, but he was able to hold on to second, it. where Quattararo just... Seventh yeah, place. But, but Brad had the same tyres. He had the medium, the medium rear and the soft front. Whereas Fabio, Franco Morbidelli, and Alex Renzo were both on the soft, soft option. Well, if you had told me that uh, Quattararo would have been the third Yamaha, I would have said no ways. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he finished behind Valentino Rossi and his teammate. The only only Yamaha finishing worse off was uh, was Maverick, and then no no sign of the factory Ducatis and uh, twenty nineteen Ducati on the podium. So. Uh, an interesting weekend <laughs> and uh, that that's why we like uh, MotoGP because look at that could have never expected a win from KTM or Brad no, if they were going to get their sure. first win I was expecting it from uh, from Espargo he's, he's been there for quite some time he knows the team he knows the bike and uh, I think Brad just took that team over because um, Espargo is going at the end of the season so yeah, I think yeah, Brad just, just put that stamp of that stamp of approval. approval. Even when Miguel goes there, Brad will be right away. And Brad proving the... people like the vet Rom showing a KTM does have brakes. <laughs> and he breaks yeah, them yeah. extremely late. So uh on the uh on the riders championship Fabio Quattararo still leads the championship. Leads from Maverick Vinales in second, Morbidelli in third, Davizioso. How did Davizioso get into fourth in the championship? Oh, wow. And because of his podium that he had in Jerez. And then there's a South African flag there, boys. In Brad, first. Binder, Brad Binder is fifth in the championship. Oh, I, I think he would have taken that at the beginning of the season. But what I love is the, po is the position jump. 14 <laughs> positions. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Took took fourteen positions from. Oh well. And uh, remember that that's only three rounds, and he didn't finish one of them. Yeah. So uh, if you had to add a semi decent result there, where he picked up about ten points, he would have been second in the championship. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> third in the championship. Sorry. So. Uh, it uh, just shows you just one fall, but uh, I think now his his confidence is going to be better, and uh, he's got that first win under his belt. He knows he can do it. It's not just a dream anymore. It's something that he's the uh, first one is V. That's all you need. It's just the first one. And what yeah, is, is the first work? thing? Is the first drop on the bike and that first win on the bike? Yes. What a feeling for a guy who probably started when he started watching. How old is Brad Binder? He's 24. He's my age. Okay. He's my age. 24, right? Yeah. Okay. So if he's 24, so if he's 24 and Rossi's been riding for 20 years, oh, wow. okay, he was four years old when Rossi started riding a MotoGP bike. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so in all likelihood, when this guy was old enough to watch and understand, he's watched MotoGP his whole life with Valentino Rossi. 
And Valentino yeah. Rossi came and shook his hand after the race mm. and gave him a pat on the back. And what that that must be a feeling. Imagine you've watched this man. guy race, you've watched him win multiple titles, and then you go and you actually finish ahead of him. So he was very calm on the podium as well. So he yeah, was, yeah. was very, very calm. Looked like he had done it all before. <laughs> Uh, Just saying to the whole world, not all South Africans are like Frick. It's <laughs> <laughs> bringing up the uh, MotoGP calendar. You can't see the final change there because the, the podcast banner is covering it, but I swear it's there. Uh, the final round of MotoGP has been confirmed. It will be Portimong in the south of Portugal. That's in Algarve. Same venue where the WSBK was last weekend and where the Formula One will be going in a couple of weeks. Um, so, yeah, they went from having a World Superbike race to having a full calendar with Formula One races and MotoGP races. I, they didn't see that coming. And uh, now they've also got funding to do a complete resurface of the circuit. So, um, I think that, that circuit's been around for quite some time and it was purpose-built for F1 and uh never got used for that purpose so uh it's great to see uh another another race being added to the calendar i'm actually sad that they didn't sort out finland finland was supposed to have its debut yeah. race this year and uh seems like everyone who was supposed to have a debut race this year didn't get it um netherlands never got their race vietnam never got their race and then in MotoGP's case Finland never got their race. So uh, all the new tracks we were expecting, we didn't get. And uh, we got a whole bunch of different circuits. But, uh, if you had told me Imola will be on the F1 calendar. <laughs> no way. No <laughs> no. Way. No, no. Remember when we were all sitting there trying to figure out, wait, is the Australian Grand Prix cancelled? Um, the, the only If you had told me a week before the Australian Grand Prix. Season finale will be in Imola. I would have I would have asked you what you're smoking because there's nothing else I could say to that. That's ridiculous. Imola. Finale. Well, apparently, it's not going to be the finale. Uh, just waiting for an official announcement from F1. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, three so Grand Prix should be added. Yeah, yeah. Two circuits. Um, well... Three, actually, if you want to call it that. We're going to do Bahrain back-to-back, -back, but it's going to be different circuits. It's going to be the circuit we've all come to layout. know uh, for the first week. And then the second week will be what's known as their endurance circuit or the outer circuit, um, slightly longer. Uh, it was used in 2010 by Formula One. And then I think in 2011, there was a protest and the Bahrain Grand Prix was cancelled. And then in 2012, it went back to to its old format. So uh, it only got used once and never again. So uh, I think that could be interesting, having back-to-back -back races, but it's but not the same circuit. Layout. So uh, can't really compare the lap times from last week. It's something completely different. Uh, well, Sector 1 and Sector 3 are exactly the same, but Sector 2 is something... And in that case, then maybe the extra practice session, like what we said earlier, just reduce it to one practice session, maybe they still allow the extra practice session. Allow the extra practice session for the for the circuits. They'd, well, they've actually gone against that grain because, I mean, they're going to go to Imola with less practice than usual at a track. They, they're not going to have any data for a hybrid car around Imola. The last I mean, definitely. Last, if one goes, 20, I don't, I don't even... I'm 2000... Sure. 2012? Or was it before that? No, it was before that. It was 2006 or 2007. Mm. It was the very last race around Imola. I was about see to that, say, uh, Schumacher was still in the mix. Yeah. yeah. Round about that, that early 2000s. Returning, returning to Miller. Apparently, they have made a a change to that to that circuit. So um, the final chicane on the circuit. Apparently, they've opened that up, and that is no longer a chicane. Oh um, wow! And and the reasoning behind it was to lengthen the pit entry. 
because the pit entry in its current state was not deemed uh, grade one satisfactory. Mm -hmm. So uh, there will be a, there will be a slight change at the end of the circuit, and in fact they'll they'll get rid of a chicane. So so no complaining there. I'm also complaining because that's with uh, one piece only that I never liked about the track. The chicane right before you go over the start finish line. Yeah. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna open that up so that they can uh, they can lengthen the pit entry. So um, oh, that's that's the same layout that they used for the SBK. Was that chicane? <coughs> on the, basically, it's on the pit straight. That chicane. Never never really been a fan of adding chicanes where they where they it's it's not part of the circuit. It's been put there to slow you down. Then I don't like it. Um, you know, Abu Dhabi should be fresh in everyone's memory we were there last week um there's got now i'm trying to think you know there's there's a hairpin okay and now there's a place there where you could technically go straight you can see the track is there to go straight but it makes you turn and then yeah. go into the hairpin now the track was never designed for f1 cars to go around it the way it's supposed to the way it's going around it now they were supposed to go down that straight and into that hairpin. There was no chicane. But the reason they did that was that the grandstand was built too close to the corner. <laughs> so a chicane was added because the cars would be arriving at that hairpin well, too fast. A certain for, for person in this podcast actually showed us the exact part of a track that you're referring to on Friday. Oh, yes. When he rushed, when he rushed back to the pits to get back in time so he could put in another lap. So he actually, he actually made use of that straight. No, I did. So I know exactly what part of the track you're referring to. Just, uh, when I'm using a few, few shortcuts. Got better you. than, better than spinning everywhere. Like, uh, did you guys hear the Daniel Ricardo comment? Mm -hmm. No. When he spun. Mm -hmm. When he when he said to his team, "I'm sorry, guys. I had a bit of a seb spin." Oh. Ow. Ow. It's actually got a name within F1. Yes. Yeah. Referring to what happened to Vettel on the very first lap. <laughs> okay, to to give him credit, he didn't spin it all the way around. He just sort of hung it sideways. Uh, I don't know what that was, but, but that took him like to the, the end of the grid. And how long did it take him to? to make up positions and to get somewhere. Um, it took him seven laps to go from 20th to 17th. So I uh, don't know what is going on there with uh, with Sebastian. But uh, like you mentioned earlier, I think Muna mentioned it earlier, he, has, uh, he actually has asked for a new chassis. And um, Ferrari have said yes. So uh, when that chassis will arrive, we don't know. Um, obviously there'll be a break after Spain. Um, where do we go after Spain? Okay, now I'm not sure. I've lost track of the calendar. Mm -hmm. Oh, we go to, no, we don't go to Spa. No. 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 Monza was round Italy, eight. Italy, Italy or Italy Russia. Russia. I need to go have a good look at that calendar because now I'm not sure what the F1 calendar is with. Where do we go after Spain? But uh, obviously, there's going to be three Italian rounds. And uh, Max has saved hang Ferrari on, from on, uh, on, on, on. Schumacher losing is, his record is, in Magello. It is Spa. Spain and then, and then Belgium. Oh, wow. Really? It's at Spa? Uh, for some reason, I th that came to mind. But I, So, they're going to Spa, followed by Monza. Yeah, because Monza is the first of the Italian Grand Prix. And then Monza was originally the finale, and now they've added Mugello. I can't even remember. They added, they added Mugello. Never been. And then, and then they added another three trucks. Has Sochi been added? Yeah, Sochi is added, correct. But the, I think the final three, I think that would be... Because initially, when initially when we made it 10, it was obviously Spain, Belgium, Italy... Being they added Mugello and Sochi. 
Yeah, they added Magello and Sochi. That's and it. then they and, and then, then they like, added came Imola. Imola, Portimong, and uh So we'll see we'll see how that goes. Later on in the calendar when these cars start arriving at circuits that they have no data for and who did test at Portimong? Two teams tested at Portimong. It was uh, Renault and um, Ferrari. So <coughs> Renault and Ferrari should have some sort of data. I don't know if that data is going to be able to be applicable to them after the after the resurface. And I I know the resurface is definitely for the MotoGP. I don't know if it's going to be done in between the Formula One and the GP, or if they're going to literally start working on it right now. Um, but I know the GP will definitely be on a resurfaced Portimong. So I suppose they're going to start doing that already for the F1. I can't imagine they're going to do that in between F1 and GP. They're going to be working around the clock there on, on that circuit to get things uh, up and running in time. And obviously uh, so much other motorsport that happened over the weekend and we can't get into everything otherwise we're going to go way over the hour but uh, oh, wait, obviously wait. there was world superbikes over in uh, in portugal I said already formula one and motor gp they'll be visiting that venue um in the next couple of weeks and uh there's also been a lot of formula e uh formula e went uh, went another route with how they were going to finish their season they had to get they had to get through six rounds they had six rounds remaining on the calendar they decided to do their six rounds at one venue over the space of eight days i think and um yeah two two races one break day two races one break day and then so uh you know there's no fan so we got the racetrack all to himself they uh they actually raced the racetrack in three different formats over the six races so for the first two races they ran the racetrack backwards then uh for the next two races they ran it the way they usually would and then for the next two races they will run an extended version of the circuit mm -hmm. so um antonio felix da costa he wrapped up that championship i think that was on uh friday saturday night um he uh he obviously won three races in a row the last round in 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 Makaresh in Morocco just before uh just before covid he he won that race and then uh formula e coming back he won the first two races of the season and basically put the car in the podium the next two rounds and it was enough to win the championship so uh he finally gets the single seater championship he's been after for a long time and uh, you could see on the podium that uh it, it meant a lot to him. so um another another marco reject wins a championship somewhere else <laughs> yeah that's one way to put it sebastian buemi's won one formula e championship twice correct correct, correct. and i mean he was in the toro rosso seat and if you just look at all the red bull casualties in that uh <laughs> in that in that list the formula e or actually formula one casualties in that formula e list and uh no. i just enjoy formula e because you know what they race this, they the other day they did the same racetrack the guy who you qualified in pole three, four, for the five, one race yeah. the guy who qualified in pole for the one race the next night at exactly the same racetrack in the same car he qualified 18th and his lap wasn't that much slower than yesterday. And that's it's nice, nice. It's uh, very close. The times are very close. And uh, the, the the cars are very competitive. I mean, I've seen... Actually, the the team that won the... The, the constructors that won the championship, it's a team called... Uh, I think it's DS... DS Cheetah? Something yes, like yes. that. And um, they're... When you compare it to some of the manufacturers in Formula E, I mean, you're going against the likes of Porsche and Audi and BMW and Merck and, and Nissan and Mahindra, and this is actually a private team. And, uh, yeah, they, they won the Constructors quite by, by quite some distance. There's still two rounds to go, and they've won the Constructors from, from all these manufacturers. And um, Merck, Merck did pretty well. I think they uh, they picked up a podium in their, in their debut season. So... Uh, Watch, watch that space. I don't think they're quite 
happy with just dominating one form of motorsport. But, it, mm -hmm. but it's nice seeing so many manufacturers involved going at it and manufacturers where you all know. Unlike F1, where you just see the elite bunch, yeah, where you see almost everyone. And the fact is that they're also prepared to go um, reverse grid, as you said earlier. So they're not scared to try things. And you have wheel to wheel racing, and as you said now, one day you're top, next day the very same place you're at the back. So anything can happen, and it's a lot more closer. And no guy win the championship two, three, four times in a row like in F1. So, so Formula E is really, really on the rise, in my opinion, and it's going to get a lot more interest going forward. Formula E going forward, um, there's a lot of talk in Formula One about zero emissions. Now, it's, to truly get wow. zero emissions, you're, I wouldn't say well, it's still expensive, but really... Your most simple, what we know, the technology we know that we have in our hands right now that is zero emissions is electric. Correct. And Formula One cannot go electric. That's why they have to do all this other hybrid stuff. And Formula One is not allowed to go fully electric until the year 2040. Well, so um, Formula E has the license until 2040 to be the top form of single seater electronic racing so if formula one ever wants to adopt that motor they would either have to buy formula e or merge it yeah but not just that with with them mentioning the term of um non-emission yeah okay that means that there is a byproduct of the a combustion cycle okay now in a hybrid system or a hydrogen fuel cell it still produces emissions yeah. Although it is H2O, but it is still classified as an emission. Even if it's water? Even if it's water. Oh, well. It's still a byproduct. Okay, so you, so this, so this motor would have to generate power without having any waste? Yes. If you want a zero emissions vehicle, it must produce no waste. It would have to be perfect. It would have to be electric. It would not have an exhaust pipe because it yeah. would yeah. use everything. Yes, yes. There'd be nothing left for, in, for, for use of an exhaust pipe. It would literally use... I don't know how they get that. The, the wording... Now that it's explained that way, the wording sounds terrible. Yeah, exactly. Um, you see, so it's not... They haven't fully explained... So there is... Nothing can truly be zero emission. It's it's against okay. physics. It's there Anything needs to be something left over. It can be transformed. Yeah. It can be transformed into something else. Yes. It's true. But uh that's uh reached our uh, we've reached we've almost reached our hour. Two and a half minutes to go keep these things to focus sometimes we ramble i think the longest one was an hour and 47 minutes guys <laughs> and that was the last time we had an f1 MotoGP gp double header so i think we did a lot better this time around or devon just wasn't rambling um, i'm swearing yeah well he wasn't swearing all over the podcast you know yeah no there's a lot of old folk that know that it, i don't know if there's old i don't know who watches this Apparently, there's a guy in Canada that watches this. So, guy in Canada, thank you very much. I see it there on the analytics. Uh, we get like we get like a percentage of viewers from Canada, and it's always a, like more or less the same percentage. So, some person in Canada is uh, is watching our podcast. For if you're from North America and you're looking for expert analysis on F1, oh yeah, TMB guys, we're definitely. We're definitely where you want to be because you'll learn a whole lot more than F1 with us. But um, obviously, before we go, in a different perspective. We'll uh, before. Uh, I think. Uh, sorry about that. I was just uh, I was watching a, a a race in the corner of my eye, and the stream just dropped. So uh, yeah, boy. lost my track of thought there. But uh, just before we go, let's just uh, obviously we're going to Sochi next weekend. I haven't seen a lot of time trial times up on the uh, on the board, so I think guys are keeping their cards close to their chest. 
But, but um, also, some of the guys have slightly fo- uh, split focus this week. Because this week is also the start of the first season with Sonic Sim Racing. And some of the guys race V, not just here, with F1. And it's uh, first day and Friday night, so two nights in a row. One night that, one night F1. So it's a bit of a divided attention at the moment. I'll be co-commentating on Thursday with Johan. And uh, Johan is uh, the more experienced of the two when it comes to GT racing. So I'll let you tell them about SSR. Where, where is the race? I don't, I'm, I'm letting him do it because I don't know where it is. So tell us, tell us where the race is. Uh, endura- is it endurance? How long is it? And uh, who, who are your favorites? No, no. As actually as a fellow admin there, and obviously as a racer there as well, I actually want to give that honor to Muna because Muna is more clued up. We, like you say, we're just doing the talking of nonsense and looking at the cars. He's more actively involved in racing and for organizing. Um, well, it's a full hour race, um, with a 20 minute practice, or 10 minute practice, and a 20 minute quality. Um, very, very interesting season. We've got quite a few actual professional racing drivers that have joined us this season. So, if you can win, you know how to go. That's all I can say. <laughs> but uh, I'm very looking forward to it, especially with you two guys commentating. Is there a uh, Monza, if I'm not mistaken? Monza, sorry, yes, Monza. Um, I already know a lot of the guys are concerned about turn one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the usual. The usual chicane. <laughs> uh, that chicane is, uh, that chicane is difficult enough. It's difficult enough to get around in a Formula One car when you've got all sort of downforce and all sort of and uh, in those yeah in those bigger cars. But turn yeah. one is always uh, because that first lap, that opener, that pull away, that first corner. I just feel so, I just feel I just feel sorry for Dirk. He's gonna have to get that uh, that bus, that boat around uh, <laughs> around turn one. That's yeah. Okay, so uh, Dirk, the only guy we in uh, in that car. Oh, the only one we know of. Uh, not sure if anyone's changed any selections, but the last time I was in a lobby with these guys. Uh, it was just the one Bentley, and then there's uh, one Bentley, two Astons. I think there's currently three or four Porsches, mm-hmm. and about three to four uh, Ferraris. And then black Mumbas, not Mumbas. Mumba. And then the uh, stream on Thursday night, uh, we'll uh, we'll do a dual stream where Johan will obviously upload to the SSR YouTube channel. And then uh, I'll just upload a, a copy onto here. It is sometimes useful, as Johan saw last last Friday. Um, I believe yep, your stream yep. cut out right at the end there, and we were able to get the right results of Twitch from Devon. So uh, final in few meters. We even did the driver. We even did the driver interview through through Twitch. So uh, that that second stream can come in handy and. Uh, I think we're going to need it, John, because uh, the spectator mode isn't quite where we would like it. And um, work in motion. You get uh, when a session ends, whoever you're watching, that car goes to the pits, and then you get stuck in the pits. So every time a session ends, both commentators are going to have to leave, rejoin. So uh, we'll we'll do it in shifts. You go. I'll commentate on what I can see, and when you're back, I'll go. So, yeah. Well, yeah. There, there, is, there is talks about a big update coming tomorrow. Um, this is rumors. Yeah, this is rumors and not official yet. So, I'm still wait and see what what happens. Just uh, keep keep your eyes peeled for that uh, for that update, and if it does come up tomorrow, make sure you leave your PlayStation in rest mode and 
Make sure you get that downloaded <laughs> before Thursday. Oh, uh, yes. Might. While you talk about that, F1 also have an update this week. Two games. So, the same story there. Make sure the game is updated before you come racing on Friday night. Unless you have no intention of practicing between now and Friday night, I'm sure you will come across that uh, that update. So, uh, get it done. It's also it's a pretty big update, so you don't want to leave it for the for the last second. Could uh, could take a while depending on your uh, on your connection, guys. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much for joining us. Obviously, we'll be uh, we'll be in Monza on on Thursday night for uh, for SSR. Johan and myself will be and in we'll, Russia on Friday night. We'll be coming. You know, this is not right. You know, I should I should actually drive an SSR and and commentate in TNB. Um, I know nothing about GT racing, um, and in Formula One, I have to listen to these two idiots. So um, I'm a privileged one. I'm I'm in both. Because Thursday night, of course, I have Jonathan. Then on Friday night, he's racing. Then I have Devin in the comms box who on Thursday night is racing. So yeah, it's quite interesting. I think it could be uh, could be quite beneficial to the stream going forward because. Uh, Obviously, going forward, we want to we want to give you obviously updates on everything that's happening in the motorsport world, as well as TNB and SSR, and uh, you'll have two commentators from SSR and two commentators from from Formula One. But if Johan joins us most of the time, you'll have you'll have both perspectives. Yeah. yeah. So thank you very much. We'll see you on Thursday. If not, we'll see you on Friday night. At Sochi. To back next week. Yeah. Start uh, practicing. Don't spend too much time in time trial because the other 19 cars aren't there. Just uh, <laughs> and that puts into fuel, isn't there? So, so just keep that in mind. You might want to just fill the tank and fi and feel what uh, turn one is really going to feel like. But uh, guys, thanks for listening. This will be on YouTube later. So if you listen on YouTube later, thanks a lot. If you're one of the live viewers, thanks a lot. And uh, yeah, no, thanks, guys. next week. Thank you, people. If not Have sooner. And stay safe. Cheers, guys. Cheers. 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 Cheers.